Good afternoon. Today is Thursday, January 28th, uh, 2021. We are rapidly approaching the end of this section. In fact, the test is one week from today. We just have to finish up the things we need to know about cells. Uh, towards that end today, uh, we are going to focus on the rest of the anatomy, the plasma membrane, talking about its structure and then also its function as well. Again, it's that line we draw when we draw a cell, but as we're going to see, there's a whole lot more going on to that. And then in order to gauge how you are preparing for this class, I have a practice lab exam that you will take. As we talked about in the last class, all of these are questions that have been on previous exams of mine. Some of these may be in your test bank, and so they could be questions you run into on your exam. But the point of this is so that you see... I'm, I'm going to go ahead and mute that. Again, feel free to unmute if uh, you have any questions or anything along those lines. But um, these are questions, how I ask the questions, how I pointed things, how I word them. This is an opportunity for you to see what a lab exam is going to be like. And then from there, um, you can also gauge how your studying is going when you still have a week left to prepare. Towards that end, remember the exam is one week from today. That means two things. The two things is that means this weekend is your big weekend to study for it. That also means Tuesday, you're be being provided with new information two days before the exam, right? Now, remember you have the lecture outlines showing you the things that we're gonna talk about. I try to front load it as much as possible. I think the only thing we really have to talk about on Tuesday is uh, uh, protein synthesis. And while it is a long process, it won't take the entire class time. So it's not four and a half hours of new information, uh, but this is the weekend to, to prepare. And part of that preparation is looking ahead at the things that we are going to be doing. The other important thing about that too, because it shouldn't take the entire class time, is at the end of class on Tuesday, we will have time for a uh, exam review. An exam review is not where I stand up here and tell you the things that I think are important. That is what I do every day in lecture. I expect my exams to reviews to be question and answer. You come up with questions of things that you are not clear about, and we will work together to come up with the answers. And remember, if no one asks me any questions during the review, then I assume everybody has mastered the information and I make the tests harder. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the exams. It is Thursday, uh, one week from today on the 4th. Again, there is both a lab and a lecture exam, or you could ask them to be true. Don't put them on everybody else. Um, you may take them in any order that you want. However, they must be completed during class time. They will become available at noon. And both exams are available at noon. Both exams are no longer available at 4.35. So you can take them in any order. As I've said from previous experience, the ones that people tend to have more problems on are the lab exams, just because you have to download, you know, this exam is probably somewhere around 60 to 70 questions, 60 to 70 big, uh, big images. Uh, and sometimes there are problems with that. So most of the problems that I've had people have in the past, it's been with the lab exams. So I encourage you to start with the lab exam first, just to make sure that there aren't any problems. And then, uh, um, see, now you distracted me with that. Uh, oh, and then, uh, but uh, you can do it in any order that you want. <laughs> um, so again, uh, it, you, again, you only have the class time. And so while each test is timed, so again, as I talked about, let's say the lecture exam, for instance, gives you two hours, whatever much time that it has for it, uh, then, um, it also has to be completed during that time. So if you wait till four o'clock to start the lecture exam, even though the lecture exam has a two hour timer, remember the exams go down at 12.35. So you would only have 35 minutes to complete that. So you cannot, it's not, don't start it during class time. You must complete the exams during class time. Uh, the question there are, I, I know at the beginning of the semester, there were some students who had talked to me about DSPS. 
Uh, these are the, uh, that's the program on campus that has accommodations uh, for things that can assist in the exam, like extra time and things along those lines. I have not received any uh, paperwork from anybody on that. Uh, you need to get that to me before the exam so that if there are accommodations we need to make for you, uh, those can be done. So please uh, get that to me sooner rather than later. Uh, as we also talked about on Thursday, because you're doing the exams, there is no lecture on that day. I know when you look on our schedule in Confer Zoom, it's on there because it's just easier when I'm doing the semester to just say we meet daily uh, Tuesday and Thursday from noon to uh, 1235. I will not be on Zoom. So there is a while there is a Zoom link, there is no Zoom meeting. I will be available uh, by email. So I will be monitoring my email very closely. Like I said, if people have problems or something like that, uh, you can contact me. But as I've pointed out to you before, I don't, um, I don't have the ability to put you back into an exam if you get kicked out for some reason. You should be able to reconnect on your own if there, or if it locks up or something like that. I can't do anything about that. That's all Proctorio. Proctorio has a very responsive tech support that can help you if you have those problems. So if you have those problems, contact them, don't contact me. Uh, if you need to contact me for any other reason, then I will be available by email. If you wanna let me know you're having problems or something, that is fine, uh, but uh, it's limited what I'm capable of doing, all right? Then you get a nice big five days off. And here's the problem that we have with the second part of this class. The second part of this class is tissues and the integumentary system. It is about three and a half lectures worth of material. The problem is the way that the holidays fell out for us, we lost a day. So we are gonna try to cram three and a half days worth of information into three days. And this is some of the more challenging stuff because it's some of the least, least intuitive stuff. This is when we're going to be doing the heavy histology, the heavy microscope work. Uh, so to encourage you to start looking at that over that five-day weekend and thinking about that and getting prepared for that, I am assigning you the two pre-labs. These are not reviews. They're oh, not note reviews. They're not the reviews. You will be doing the reviews and turning them in. In fact, the unit five review is due on the 11th and unit six review is due on the 16th. These are the pre-labs. If you've looked at your uh, lab manual in each unit, there are the reviews at the end, there are the activities in the middle, and at the beginning are some pre-labs. And I told you, you weren't gonna be turning in a lot of these pre-labs, but that they would be good study tools for you if you wanted to take the time to do them. Well, in this case, you are gonna be doing those two and you are gonna be turning those in and they are due at the beginning of class on Tuesday when we come back to start talking about tissues so that hopefully you start to have some familiarity uh, with one of the more challenging parts of this section. All right, so no rest for the wicked. Questions on that? Excellent. Love stunned silence in the middle of the afternoon. Makes me happy. All right. Sorry, uh, for the re for the uh, the pre labs, do we turn them in the same way we do the reviews? Yeah, you turn them in the same way you have. There's an assignment. There will be an assignment in the second. You know, the second module. The second module hasn't been posted yet, uh, but uh, after the first exam. Uh, the second module will be posted with all of the outlines, with all of the handouts, and with all of the assignments. And so, yes, you would turn it in the exact same way you turn in the unit reviews. Thank you. Yep, great question. Any others? All right, spectacular. With that in our pocket then, let's move on to our final discussion of the anatomy of the cells having to do with our plasma membrane. Uh, again, we need to talk about both its structure and also its function as well. So let's start first with that. What is the function of our plasma membrane? Protection. Okay, excellent. <clears throat> Protection for what? For the inside of the cell now. Okay, yeah, protection for the cell to protect it from the outside. 
right? Forms basically a barrier, All right? Excellent. However, is its job to be- Structure. I'm sorry? Is it also structure? Yeah, absolutely. It helps to provide the structure. Provide the shape and structure of the cell, absolutely. And then semi-permeable membrane. There you go, absolutely. While it is to provide protection, while it is to be a barrier, I like that term you use, a semi-permeable barrier. What does that mean? It's permeable. Selectively allows things to go in and out of the cell. Oh, excellent. I like that description a lot. It selectively allows things in. The example I always think of is like a screen door, right? Many of you have a screen door on the front of your house, uh, which is really nice during the summer because you can open it up, or at least during the spring, because you can open it up, you can let the sun come in, the br cool breeze can come in, the sounds of the birds coming in, but the birds themselves can't come in, right? The insects can't come in. It allows some things through, but not others. Excellent. So that is what we want the function of our plasma membrane to be, to give the shape and structure to the cell, to protect the cell, but to allow things, to allow some things in and out. of the cell, because that's gonna be important as well. Now, as we've already talked about, what is the primary uh, macromolecule that makes up our plasma membrane? Phospholipids. Phospholipids. And how are those phospholipids arranged? In a bilayer. In a bilayer. Excellent. However, it turns out phospholipids are not the only lipids uh, that are part of the plasma membrane. Let's go back to our whiteboard and do a little drawing. I think everybody's got the schedule. It's at the beginning of this. So I think we're okay clearing that. Hold on one second. Okay. Not my kid's school, I don't care. All right, excellent. Um, so, phospholipids we know have, oh, no, but I want to use orange. Phospholipids have that polar head. And those two fatty acid tails make them very obvious, very distinct, very easy to recognize and identify. And I'll just draw a simple symbol for them to serve our purpose there. And as we talked about, they are arranged in a bilayer. This is gonna work. Uh, hold on, I have to cheat, I've made this too big. Ah, things gotta work. I really missed my whiteboard. Markers. Crayons. All right. All right. So we have our phospholipid bilayer. Now, while I'm drawing, finishing drawing of this, let's think about this. If you had a glass of water, we know lipids are hydrophobic. They don't like them. Fatty acids don't like them. If I had a glass of water and I carefully pooled a, a pool of, of oil on the top, put some olive oil on top of that water, right? It would stay skimming across, it would spread across the surface of that water. And once it does that, would all the lipids just find a spot and just sit there? No. No, I always imagine, and again, when my kid was in kindergarten, whenever we used to go to the classroom because they were demonstrating for us or they had to do exercises or the dances that the cute little dances and stuff they would do, all the kids kind of move around and they swung their arms around so that they wouldn't run into everybody else. And that was basically how they spaced themselves out. Everybody found a space that they could be in and move around and then the next person was there and they stopped. No, that's not what our lipids are gonna do. Our lipids actually form what we call a fluid mosaic. With this fluid mosaic, what's happening is that these phospholipids are constantly changing locations with each other. They're switching spaces. So this one will go over here and this one will come where this one is. Or this one will go here and this one will come where this one is. 
Now notice they can easily spread between uh, within a layer, but do you think it's easy for them to switch between layers? No. No. And again, these numbers are artificial, but they serve the point. Let's say that it switches position with each other once a minute. Uh, that this would happen, then that would mean that they would be able to switch layers maybe once a month, right? It can happen, but it's not nearly as common. But it's constantly moving around. They're constantly moving. They have this fluid mosaic to them. And that is great, except remember how we said we want this plasma membrane to provide structure and protection. And if it's all loosey-goosey moving around, it's not going to be able to do that. Well, luckily we have another lipid that helps us, our friend cholesterol. Remember last time we talked about cholesterol, we talked about how it was scary and all of that. We think of cholesterol as being bad and being in our blood, but what cholesterol will do, remember I'm drawing these as circles, but remember it's comprised of four carbon rings and the functional groups that are associated with them. These, and let's cheat and put this one down here these cholesterols will line up with the fatty acids. Now, if we were to name these, this one's A, this one's C, and this one's B, which ones are gonna be more likely to change position, A and B or B and C? B and C. Well, with a big cholesterol in between, is it gonna be easier oh. for them to do -si do or easier a for A and B, B to do -si do? A and B. So by putting these cholesterols within the fatty acid layer of our bilayers, we are able to add more structure, add more integrity to the plasma membrane. So this is the one of the ways that we are able to stabilize it by putting these additional uh, lipids within here, giving it more structural integrity. Okay. However, as it turns out, our, um, our plasma membrane doesn't just, isn't just comprised of lipids. There are also carbohydrates that can be attached to them. One example of this is a, a link of uh, glycogen molecules put together, a glucose molecules put together forming what we call a glycocalyx or a sugar coat. This is usually mostly on the outer surface of the plasma membrane. Although some of these glycocalyx can be located on the inside. Why might it be useful to put sugar on the outer surface of the cell? It makes it sticky. Absolutely, right? The same way that if you get your hand coated in sugar, it makes it sticky. So it provides an anchor, it provides an attachment uh, for the cell to help to anchor it together into tissue or to potentially hold it to other cells. What's the other advantage of putting these sugars on the outer surface? Would it, would it help? <laughs> Go ahead. No, you're the other one. I was asking, would it help with um, being more water friendly in any way and helping with perm like bringing things into the cell that you need. I could, I could definitely see your point that way, but remember one of the advantages of the phospholipids is that the heads are polar as well. So yes, if the heads weren't polar, then definitely that would help in that fashion. But because the heads are polar, we probably don't need that easy access to it. And, and certainly when we think of sugars, we think of it in terms of energy. Uh, but uh, again, it's on the outer surface of the cell. So it isn't necessarily helping the cell too much when it's on the outer surface. And again, mm -hmm. I have to work on my analogies with this COVID situation, but we've got a big, huge weekend, right? That's the weekend before our exam. So this is the perfect opportunity for you to jump on a plane and go to Vegas for the weekend, right? And of course, because you've made this decision last minute, you try to go and you try to get, you know, go fly standby. And when you fly standby, your bag, your black rolling bag doesn't uh, fit on the overhead. So they have to check it for you. So you get to the luggage carousel waiting for your black rolling bag to come out. And how many black rolling bags come out of that, uh, of that thing? 
the baggage carousel. Hundreds. A billion of them, absolutely. So how do you know which one's yours? I tag. The market. Yeah, you've got some kind of markers on it, right? For instance, mine, exactly. I have a nice big pink bow and a One Direction sticker on mine, making it very easy for me to be able to identify it. And that's the other things these sugars can be as well. They can be tags, they can be labels, because as we'll learn, one of the things that is really important for our body to be able to do is tell the stuff that is us and tell the stuff that is not us. And having those type of identifying, identifying molecules are important structures to have. However, we can't have something without having proteins in it. Proteins are going to be vitally, vitally important. And there are a couple uh, important characteristics to our memory. Actually, let's go back to our image. Uh, I think this might be more helpful to talk about these things this way. All right, so let's go ahead first and add some uh, carbohydrates here on the outer surface. And again, I know they're supposed to be, uh, you know, hexagons, but we'll just make them as circles. All right, some of them could actually be embedded or connected to that cholesterol and coming out this way from there, those sugars. So we have our carbohydrates, label them so we know what they are. That is one of the functions. So they can help to summarize, but they can also be, the, gly the glycocalyx in particular is that sticky sugar coat that helps to anchor the cell in place, attach it to it as surrounding tissue, attach it to the other cells. So it can do both. All right, now when we talk about proteins and we'll use red for proteins, when we talk about proteins, proteins can be integral or they can be peripheral. What do you think it means to be integral? They're inside the bilayer. Excellent. And really, we want to be more specific in one or more layers of the bilayer. So notice, for instance, we could have a protein that was just embedded in one part of the plasma membrane, or we could have one that goes through both layers. And let's go ahead and quickly draw two more phospholipids just so that to emphasize this, that there, that there. So both of these red ones now that I've drawn are integral membrane proteins. However, one goes all the way through and the other doesn't. So while both are integral transmembrane proteins, this one is also known as a transmembrane protein because it goes all the way through. So it's an integral membrane protein, but it is also a transmembrane protein. So of course, peripheral membrane proteins then aren't attached to the plasma membrane directly, but they are associated with them. They could maybe be attached to, oh, no, let's go back and make that red. They could be adjacent to the plasma membrane, even attached to one of those uh, integral membrane proteins along that way, but they are not actually in the plasma membrane. They're just associated with the plasma membrane. Yes. Yes, I did. Again, I think I've said this. I'll continue to say it. I am not a good typist. Not a good speller either, but I'm also not a good, I'm a really bad typist. I've never learned, I took photography in high school instead of typing, so I never learned how to type well. Um, and so, uh, and especially when I'm trying to talk and I'm not looking down and I'm not paying attention, uh, I have the sexy fingers, they F up a lot. So uh, don't pay any close attention to the things that I actually uh, type out, especially as far as spelling and stuff like that goes. But thank you for catching it and uh, asking it. Sometimes I try to catch them, but sometimes I get carried away with what I'm saying and I'm not paying attention. So thank you for catching that. All right, so proteins come in two flavors, integral and peripheral. Well, these are both plasma membrane proteins. So these are both plasma membrane proteins. They're both proteins that are associated with the plasma membrane. Peripheral ones do not directly connect to the plasma membrane, whereas integral membrane proteins do. 
So they're still considered uh, proteins of the plasma membrane. They're just not attached to it. That's why they're called peripheral. Now, of course, these proteins, as we talked about, are highly variable in their structure. And so not surprisingly, they're very variable in their function. Uh, some of them can serve the function of, for instance, being channels or transporters. What would the difference between a channel and a transporter be, do you think? One, let's... Uh one through and the other one brings something in. Okay, I like that definition a lot, but how, what's the difference? Because it sounds like in both cases, you're bringing something through a door. So what's the difference? You're 100% you're correct, but what, what is the big difference? I think channels are like the, the pathways and the transporters are what actually moves. Not a bad guess. Now actually- Doesn't one I, require I, energy and the other one doesn't? Yes, that's right. Exactly, there you ATP. go. Uh, if, let's, as we know, proteins are often made up of multiple subunits. So if we had a plasma membrane, and let's just cheat a little bit and do this as a block diagram. Here would be our plasma membrane, and here would be the five or six subunits of the protein uh, that made a hole in it. The proteins themselves form a structure that would be the channel, and the hole through the channel would be the pore. The example that I like to use is a door frame. The door frame would be the channel, the space that is formed by that, that allows you to walk into and out of the room is the pore. And not surprisingly, like that door frame, many channels have gates that can be opened and closed to restrict movement through them. So yes, channels are do not use ATP. And is there a fancy word we use for something that does not use ATP? Doesn't use energy? Passive. There we go, absolutely. So channels or pores are passive. They do not use ATP. They do not use energy. Whereas transporters are then going to be active. Active. They're gonna use ATP. So that's really the big difference in that. But we're not just limited to transportation with these special proteins either. Uh, they can be receptors where a hormone can bind to it and affect some type of change. Enzymes to facilitate chemical reactions. Uh, more tags so we can tell our cells and not our cells. Uh, proteins that hold and bind cells together to form strike tight combinations to really perform protection and, and integrity to our tissues. There are all these amazing functions to all these proteins that can be very, very uh, variable. And as you see our list growing, you can see, and again, I appreciate that my drawing was somewhat hideous, but we have this great picture from your textbook that does a really nice job of just showing us how there's all this hunk and junk that is going on in that single line that we draw as the outside of a cell. Notice if we take a moment or two to look at this here, we see that it's primarily made up of those phospholipids arranged in a bilayer. But notice here in yellow, we have those four carbon rings forming that cholesterol embedded within the fatty acid tails of this, providing more integrity. Notice here we have an example of one, two, three, four integral membrane proteins. Notice three of them, one, two, three, pass through both layers, so they would also be transmembrane proteins. But notice also this one just is embedded with one layer, but it's still an integral membrane protein. And notice out here on the inside, out here, uh, pardon me, on the inside, out here on the outside. And you would also say these linear proteins, since they're, if they're attached to or associated with the plasma membrane, would all be example of peripheral proteins. They're associated with the plasma membrane, but not a part of it. Lastly, here are those carbohydrates, our glycocalyx, our sugar coat. Notice most of them are on the outer surface, connect to the phospholipids, connected to the proteins, connected to the outer surface, giving us those tags, giving us that, that sticky surface. 
All right. So there's a whole lot of stuff going on in that single simple line we draw when we draw a cell. Questions on that? All right, excellent. So forms a very effective barrier, but as we also mentioned, it is semi-permeable or selectively permeable. It means allow some things through and not others. Like what? What are some of the things that it might allow through? Or lipid-based. Um, Excellent. Water. Exactly. So hold on, lipid-based uh, uh, substances. Absolutely. Remember, the barrier is really formed by those fatty acid tails. And because it's bound by those fatty acid tails, um, they, anything, you know, like, likes, like. We know water doesn't like lipids, so it wouldn't want to necessarily pass through there, but something that is lipid-based does. Someone mentioned water. Is water able to just freely pass through our fossil lipid bilayer without any help at all? No. Yes. Well, we heard both answers. Let's come back to that one. What else? Let's think of some other things. What are some other things that uh, might fit through rather than just lipids? Lipid-based is definitely one of them, but there's a couple other criteria molecules that are too small yeah absolutely they would definitely need to be small molecules now sodium ions are small can they pass through the plasma membrane without any help no no why not they're small but there's something about them what's that thing about them that doesn't let them go through true they're not lipid based but Oxygen is not lipid based and oxygen can pass right through without any problems on its own. So why can't sodium? Oh. Yeah, no, actually, it's a great question. We will talk about that more, but yes, absolutely. Uh, it's also one of the reasons why alcohol is so dangerous because it can pass through the plasma membranes of our protection and get into our brain and things along those lines. Yes, absolutely. Does so, sodium have something to do with salt? Because it, well, so what happens when you put salt in water? It dilutes or well, it dissolves. Barely. It, okay, what does it mean by dissolving? What does it mean for salt to dissolve? The water absorbs it, right? Not so much. It, it does get, what ends up happening is it gets surrounded by a shell of water. And so it does disappear when you put it into it, but something else happens to that salt first. Does it, it rearrange um, the, basically it separates the components of whatever salt is made from. What is salt made from? You guys sodium know. Sodium and whatever else it's made from, I forget. Sodium chloride. Sodium chloride. So when you put sodium chloride together in water, what happens to the sodium and the chloride? They break, break, it breaks down with H2O. They separate. Why? What kind, of, what kind of bond holds them together? Hydrogen. hydrogen. It's not a hydrogen bond that holds them together. What kind of bond holds them together? Ionic. Ionic bond. Ionic bond. Absolutely. And so when that sodium and that chloride come apart, they have a charge. Sodium is positively charged. Uh, uh, chloride is negatively charged. And do things that are polar like things that are not polar? No. 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 So we need things to be small. We need things to be lipid-based. We need them to be nonpolar. If things are small, lipid-based, and nonpolar, then they can pass through the plasma membrane without any assistance needed. We have a fancy name for that, of course, we call that simple diffusion. Oops. We call it simple diffusion. So that brings us back to water. Water is definitely a small molecule, but is it lipid based? Is it nonpolar? No. No. So does water pass through the plasma membrane without any help on its own? No. But you guys are all saying no, but what do you know to be the answer? It's transferred through osmosis. Well, but what is osmosis? I love that. 
Definition of water. What is, define osmosis for me. Water being drawn into one place. Okay, water being drawn for, to one place across a plasma membrane, and guess what? Without any help. Osmosis is simple diffusion of water. Water doesn't seem to have the criteria, but it does sneak its way in. Water definitely is the ability to pass through a plasma membrane. And as I've said before, we here in Sacramento know this better than most. Because if you were to drink a massive amount of water in a very short period of time to try to win an antiquated video game system, well, it is now an antiquated video game system, upsetting the water balance of your body, causing too much water to be absorbed into your cells, causing cells to burst, cells to die, organ failure, and ultimately death, is it worth it to not wee for the wee? No. no. All right? Because water sneaks into the cells. What's interesting is we don't fully understand how water does it. Because as we talked about, it doesn't meet the criteria of what we would suspect. However, what they believe happens has to do again with that fluid mosaic we talked about. Remember how we talked about that these phospholipids are constantly changing positions with each other. And the forces of water are very, very strong. So what they believe happens is that when these two switch spaces, there is a small gap in between. And when there's that small gap in between, water is basically able to sneak in or sneak out through those gaps as these things are moving and changing directions. So it is believed that it is the fluid mosaic characteristics of the plasma membrane that allows water to sneak its way in or out. So yes, even though it shouldn't based on the rules we came up with, oops, hold on. what did I just do? I didn't know you could do that, that's cool. All right, you can see what I'm doing now, right? You guys can see the screen, the board? Yes? Yes. Okay, yeah. perfect. Excellent. There was a pause share that I didn't realize I had. All right, excellent. Water has a way of sneaking through. And so really, osmosis really is just the simple diffusion of water, which is good. Because once we understand the rules of simple diffusion, we understand the rules of osmosis. Simple diffusion is not a concept that you're not familiar with. All of you are familiar with this idea of simple diffusion, and it doesn't necessarily have to be across a plasma membrane. You can simply have a pitcher of water. And in that pitcher of water, you can pour in some grape Kool-Aid. Because as we all know, purple Kool-Aid is the best Kool-Aid. And as you drop those crystals into the water, do they just stay huddled together in the corner of that pitcher? No. no. As I say, these are the easy questions, folks. Absolutely. If you can't answer these, it's going to get worse as we move on. No, it moves. It moves throughout. And basically, and I think someone mentioned this earlier, uh, Elda mentioned it earlier, basically our crystals are going to move, right? Diffusion is basically movement of, from a high concentration to a low concentration, All right? And again, this is passive movement. If you leave those crystals there, eventually it will spread throughout the pitcher. Now, much of, most of us are more impatient than that. So we take the big spoon in there and stir it with the spoon. But if you're stirring it with the spoon, you're adding energy and it is no longer passive. This will happen passively on its own until eventually we reach a point 
where all of the crystals are equally distributed throughout the entire picture. And what do we call that point? Equilibrium. Equilibrium, absolutely. No, it's not saturation. Saturation is when we get the most dissolved as we can. In this case, the goal of diffusion is to reach equilibrium. But we need to define what equilibrium means as well. Because like I'm drawing here, like those kindergartners that I was talking about, are these Kool-Aid molecules flailing their arms around? And as they flail their arms around, they find their perfect spot and then they stay there forever? No. No. Equilibrium uh, is doesn't mean that there is no movement. At equilibrium, there is still a ton of movement that takes place. The key is that there is no net change. So what that means is for every Kool-Aid molecule that goes down, one goes up. For every one that goes to the right, one goes to the left. And again, you probably haven't thought of it in these terms, but if you've ever sat for hours and stared at a picture of Kool-Aid like I have, as you sit there for several hours staring at it, will suddenly and instantaneously there appear a clear spot in the middle of it where all of the Kool-Aid moved out of that area and you just see crystal clear water in that spot? No. No, of course not. Because once it reaches that point of equilibrium, once it reaches, um, Kool-Aid isn't chemistry. <laughs> this is physics. This is physics. This is not chemistry. Um, once you reach that point of equilibrium, uh, then it stays there. Well, exactly. Chemistry can't even come up with its own theories. It has to steal stuff from physics. Again, horrible, <laughs> horrible people. All right, excellent. So we have this idea of diffusion. Uh, we re the goal is to reach equilibrium. And again, that doesn't mean there's no movement at that point. That means there is no net change. All right, so far so good. All right, now, while diffusion is passive, there are, oops, I have my cap on. There are factors that can affect the speed. What are some of the factors that we have that can change the rate of diffusion, make diffusion occur faster or slower? Temperature. Temperature, absolutely. Temperature is one of the big ones. Uh, when the temperature increases, what happens to the rate of diffusion? It speeds up. It speeds up, absolutely. The reason, of course, for this is that we're saying it's passive. There's no, we are not providing energy. By passive, we mean we don't provide energy. Instead, it relies on the kinetic energy of the molecules. And when temperature goes up, let me make that a little smaller so it fits in the space. When temperature goes up, Kinetic energy goes up, and so it moves more rapidly. Absolutely. What else? Um, isn't it also gradient? Excellent. I love that. Concentration gradient. All right. Oops. Let's. Uh, what do you mean by that? Um, to be honest, I just watched the lectures earlier, so I just remembered that. Okay, that's all right. Okay, so let's figure this out. Let's say I have two beakers, all right? And in both of these beakers, I put a uh, rubber sheet down the center of them, basically a diaphragm separating them. On one side of these, I put 95% Kool-Aid, and on the other one, I put 50% Kool-Aid. I then, and let's name them. This one's A and this one's B. Now, I then take a screwdriver and with that screwdriver, I poke three holes in both of these diaphragms. 
Is Kool-Aid going to move from the left to the right? Yes. Excellent. All right. So let's bring up our participation windows here. Excellent. So if you think A will have the faster moving Kool-Aid, click yes. If you think B, then click no. So which beaker is going to have the faster moving Kool-Aid? A, if you, uh, a, yes for A, B for no. And there's 34 of you. I should get 34 answers, not eight. Come on. Oh, I like that. There you go. You caught me. No, I love it. You don't have the full information. Absolutely. You need to know what's going on on the other side of the beaker. What if I told you over here was 90% uh, Kool-Aid? And what if I told you over here was 10% Kool-Aid? Now, which one goes faster? B. Yes for A, no for B. I ain't getting the idea, although now it's going back down. Come on. Interact. Uh, you guys don't want me to have to make quizlets that I have to bring up and force you to ask the, answer these questions. Work with me on these. There we go. Slowly getting there. All right, B, B, no, no, no. Okay, okay, I'm seeing it all in the chat. All right, absolutely. It's not the overall concentration. It's the difference between the two environments. It's the steepness of the hill. If you stand at the top of a hill and let a ball go, it rolls very, very fast. If you stand on a relatively low hill and let a ball go, it goes relatively slow. All right? So it's not just the overall concentration, but the differences between the two locations that determines it. Absolutely. So concentration gradient is a huge one. What else? What else besides concentration gradient and temperature? Would pH have something to do with that? Well, would pH necessarily affect, it could affect some things, but it wouldn't necessarily affect Kool-Aid. So I think we're okay that way. For the plasma membrane, the pore um, amount of pores or the size of pores? Absolutely. So if we went back to that previous example and I poked 20 holes versus two holes, the one with 20 holes would do more. So absolutely. Uh, the way we would identify that is basically the surface area for exchange. So surface area is how you would describe that. Absolutely. That's a perfect way to do it. I can think of at least two more good ones. Is that the size of the molecule, the surface area? Exactly, the size or the mass. What moves faster, big things or little things? Little, little things are gonna move faster, absolutely. Right, so my Kool-Aid's gonna diffuse much more rapidly than if I fill this pitcher filled with Volkswagens or something like that, right, absolutely. So size, mass makes a difference. I can think of one other good one. So let's think of it this way. Let's say I have two pitchers that I'm gonna make my Kool-Aid in. Both hold exactly one liter. One pitcher is very tall and narrow and the other pitcher is short and squat. Now both contain a liter, a liter of water. So it's the same amount of water, the same amount of, of Kool-Aid. So it's not concentration gradient, but would these both reach equilibrium at the same time? No. No, the taller one would. Taller one would, would first or I, the- I think it's the shorter one. The shorter one. Why do you think it's the shorter one? Well, I'm just like thinking back to like how, like the thing that I would just like thought of was um, like a coffee cup, like the taller coffee cup and then like a, a, sh a shorter but a stouter one. Mm -hmm. If you put hot coffee in it, um, the shorter one is gonna cool down faster because it has like a larger opening on top. Therefore it's like, it's being exposed more to like air. Okay, so well that would, I think that would oh. be a perfect example of surface area. The more surface area, the more rapidly it loses the heat. But as it turns out, you're actually right because the other big difference, the other big factor is the distance it has to travel. The distances to reach equilibrium in the smaller uh, squatter one is gonna be way different than the long distance it has to travel uh, to reach equilibrium in the tall one. So the distance it has to travel, the shorter the distance, the faster the diffusion. Excellent. Let's see if we hit them all. 
let's switch back to the lecture. Oh, and then, of course, I guess this was one other point we needed to, of course, emphasize, but we'll talk about a lot. Obviously, we're still talking about simple diffusion. If you're not small, if you're not water, if you're not lipid base, if you're not nonpolar, then you need some type of integral membrane protein, and really a trans membrane protein. Does pressure uh, have some something to do with this? Pressure has a huge effect on the diffusion of gases. So on gases, basically, instead of concentration gradient, they use pressure gradient. So pressure gradient and concentration gradient would work uh, the same way. Pressure for gases, concentration for, for uh, uh, substances that are dissolved into the solution. All right, here's my pretty picture. Come on, where's my pretty picture? There it is. Oh. So, get rid of that. Again. Okay, maybe not a packet of Kool-Aid, but it's a cube of uh, solution, put in, I mean, cube of substance put into a solution and it diffuses and reaches equilibrium. And again, it's driven by the kinetic energy, but we can speed it up with our concentration gradient, our temperature, our size, our mass, the distance and the surface area. Excellent, we hit all of them. So those are the big factors that influence diffusion. All right, now, Again, when we're talking about the movement of, mu of, of molecules, when you have a door frame, like we talked about, when you have a channel, that door frame, does it determine which way you go through that door? No. No, you can way. move either way through a door frame. So it can be moved in both directions. You can easily go through a channel in both directions. So what matters is your driving force. What is the driving force that is trying to get you to move? And the primary one, as we've talked about, is that concentration gradient. Things like to go from a high concentration to a low concentration. Just like we talked about with that ball. I stand on top of a hill and let a ball go and that ball will roll down the hill by itself. Do I have to use any energy to get that ball to roll on its own? No. No, it's completely passive. I don't have to do any work. And it's the exact same thing here. Molecules are gonna move from a high concentration to a low concentration passively without any kind of energy other than the kinetic energy. Passive movement, no ATP is used. However, what happens if I want to get that ball to go back up the hill? Will it do that on its own? No, if I, no, want, it to go, no. No, if I want it to go back up the hill, then I need to use energy. And typically to use energy requires a very special type of protein, like we call, we call them transporters, or we can also call them pumps. And they're then going to use ATP to move a substance against its concentration gradient. Right? Or at least usually. I guess there's some other times when we would use it otherwise, but usually, oops. It's going to move it against the concentration gradient. I have to use energy to roll that ball up the hill. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Um, can you go back? Yep. Oh, you already said that mine. Yep, no worries. So the other thing I would remind you as well is remember these lecture slides are available on Canvas. Even if you don't print them out, uh, there is a Canvas app. So if you have your phone or you have an iPad or something like that, you can download the Canvas app for students. You could actually have the handouts on there. You could then make notes on them there if you want or something like that. But you could at least see them while you're studying so that you don't have to feel the pressure to write down everything that's on the board. So these things are available for you. Remember, you do have access to these things to help you to be successful if that's something that you want to do. Uh, I'm happy to go back if you want to write something down, but, uh, but just do know that those things are there for you available. 
yeah, I think the most important part is when when you write it. That's what I start writing down. <laughs> when you, write yeah, it. me too. <laughs> no worries, no worries. I appreciate that. Excellent. All right, so <laughs> we've been talking so far about Kool Aid. So let's draw a couple more beakers. We'll start with this one first. And again, it's got water in it. And again, it has some type of diaphragm that is dividing it in half. Uh, I don't like that. We'll actually cheat and use the line drawer. Excellent. Now, as I just keep talking about, if I put 75% Kool-Aid on this side, and then I put 15% Kool-Aid on this side, Kool-Aid, excellent also delicious. Um, and then again, I take my screwdriver and I poke those holes in the membrane. Which way is Kool-Aid going to move? It's going to go to the right. Yeah, absolutely. It is going to go to the right and it's going to continue to go to the right until what happens? So there's like an equal equilibrium. And what would equilibrium be in this case? Um, How much? 50-50. Would it be 50% and 50%? Uh, 45. It, what are these if there's no 50, 50? Yeah, there you go. 45% Kool-Aid on this side, and it would be 45% on that side. And at that point, it would reach equilibrium. At equilibrium, is there no more movement? No, there's still movement. No, no, there's still movement. It's just no more net movement. For, so for everyone that went to the left, one would go to the right. Okay. Now, thankfully for us, our cells are a little more sophisticated than this. They don't have to just use screwdrivers to poke holes in the plasma membrane to get things to go from one side to another. But that is also how things get a little bit trickier. Because in this case, and let's go ahead and cheat a little bit, and I will do that, and that, and that, and that, and that, and that. If instead, this side was 75% salt, sodium chloride, and this side over here was 15% sodium chloride. Now, obviously, if I just poked holes in the plasma membrane, then just like we saw before, you would have 45% on one side and 45% on the other. But in this case, I'm going to put a special channel in this plasma membrane. And this special channel lets sodium move, but not chloride. So it is a sodium channel that only sodium can pass through. What's going to happen then? Well, let's start really simple. Instead of percentages, let's say that there are 75 sodiums on this side, sodium chlorides on this side, and 75 on that side, All right? So what we know is that when we put this in the water, it is going to disassociate, and you're going to have 75 sodium ions, and you're going to have 75 chloride ions. Well, that's the question I'm asking you, Leah. Absolutely. So let's let's work it out. On this side, let's say we have 15 sodium ions and we have 15 chloride ions. Now, you are absolutely correct. Sodium is going to want to reach equilibrium. So what's going to happen is one sodium is going to move from the left to the right. When that occurs, how many chloride ions do we have on the left? 75. 75. How many chloride ions, I mean, sodium ions do we have on the left now? Oh, 74. Oh. Now we have 74. Um. And the same thing has happened over here. We still have 15 chlorides. The problem is now we have 16 sodiums on this side. 
Notice right here with the very first one moving, we have a little bit of an issue. Before on this side, we had 75 positive things and 75 negative things. But now I only have 74 positive and 75 negative. What has happened to this side of my picture? It's not in equilibrium. Right, so it, it's negative, one would even say. Yeah. Becomes negatively charged. And what has happened to the other side of my picture? Positive. Yeah, it's becoming positively charged. And then another sodium moves and another sodium moves and another sodium moves. And what happens is this side gets more and more negative. And this side becomes more and more positive. How come positive and negative on the left and right? Why not positive on the left and negative on the right? Because sodium is going down its concentration gradient. Sodium wants to go from a high level of um, sodium to a low level of sodium. It wants to diffuse, right? It wants to passively move down its concentration gradient. Okay, so chloride wouldn't be the one moving per se. It would have been... Uh... Correct. If you have 74 thing, positive things on this side and 75 negative things on this side, you're in the negative. Right. If you have seventy four dollars in your pocket and you owe seventy five, you're in the negative. Yeah. So the chloride doesn't move. The chloride just stays put. Yeah. Well, the chloride stays put, but sodium is moving. Got it. And notice as sodium is moving, one side is getting more positive and one side is getting more negative. And we know one more thing about sodium. Sodium is a positive ion. Is there a fancy name for a positive ion? Anion? Anion? Positive? Cation. Anion. Anion. Cation, absolutely. Yeah. Anions would be the other one. Cation, absolutely. Do positive ions or does anything positive like positive things? No. No. So notice what's going to start to happen. What is going to start to happen is that as this side gets more positive, Sodium is not going to, is sodium is going to be repulsed from it. Sodium will want to move away because it's a positive ion. This type of force is what we call an electrical force. So notice, oops, this concentration gradient. So here we have a concentration gradient. is what we call the chemical force. And our electrical gradient, the uh, positive or negative, the voltage of the cell produces an electrical force. And so we have these two forces. So in this case, equilibrium for our sodium is going to be when the electrical force and the, and the chemical force are equal and opposite of each other. Oh, I like that. Cation's got a T in it that looks like a positive sign. I like that. I like that a lot. I love mnemonics. Mnemonics are great ways of learning things. I like that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. So we have these two forces. Now, obviously, I've set this up artificially in our beaker, but guess what? Cells work the exact same way. So let's see if we can figure that out. Let's draw a cell and start writing in some of the things that we know. Where is there more sodium? Inside the cell or outside the cell? Inside, no, outside. Outside, more sodium outside the cell. Where is there more potassium? Inside. Inside the cell. Where is there more calcium? Outside. Outside the cell. Where is there more chloride? Outside. Outside the cell, excellent. And so of course that means the opposite is also true. 
there is less potassium outside the cell. There is less sodium inside the cell. There is less calcium inside the cell. And there is less chloride inside the cell. So remember, one of the things we talked about is there is an unequal balance of ions inside and outside the cell. But it turns out there's also an unequal balance in charge. There's an uneven bound, uh, a balance in voltage as well. It turns out the inside of the cell is more negative than the outside. There are more negative things on the inside and more positive things on the outside. And so our cell has what we call a resting membrane potential. This is basically when the cell is at equilibrium. And again, with equilibrium, does that mean that there's no movement at all? No. No, remember equilibrium means that there's no net movement. So with that no net movement, if you leave a cell alone and don't mess with it, it will happily stay at its resting membrane potential forever. And that resting membrane potential, as it turns out, is around, and the number we'll use in this class, negative 70 millivolts. So the inside of the cell is more negative than the outside. And this is like all the cells, right? Yes, because in this class, the sky is blue, right? Have we talked about that yet in here? No. Okay, so yes. So right next door is my 13-year-old daughter. If I went over there and asked her what color the sky is, well, honestly, she'd roll her eyes. But uh, right. what she would do is she would say the sky is blue. However, at night, is the sky blue, right? No. When it's raining, is the sky blue? At sunset, at sunrise, is the sky blue? Does that mean my daughter's stupid? Well, maybe a little bit, but uh, no. <laughs> but uh, no, saying the sky is blue is a basic answer that is right most of the time. It is a simplified answer, right? And that's what things are in this class. I guarantee you every single concept we talk about in this class is far more complicated than we have the opportunity to discuss among ourselves, right? So our goal in this class is to learn about how the sky is blue. When you get to grad school or medical school or nursing programs, that's when you get to learn about when the sky is gray and when the sky is purple and the sky is orange. But in this class, the sky is blue. Is every single cell in your body, is its resting membrane potential negative 70 millivolts? No, but in this class, it is. So we are simplifying it, our resting membrane potential of every cell we will talk about in this class and 431 for that matter is gonna be negative 70 millivolts. Okay, so the sky is blue. Yes, every single cell in your body, resting membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts. All right, so what that means is for all of these ions, these ions are going to have both, oops, I didn't wanna change that, oh, well, too late both a chemical force and a electrical force that is going to influence its movement. Too small, that, that works. So let's figure them out. For sodium, what would the direction of the chemical force be? into the cell or out of the cell. Remember, chemical force is our concentration gradient. Oh, Where, we want to get in. Exactly. Whereas our electrical force has to do with the charge. Excellent. So chemical force in this case is going to be into the cell. It's going to want to go in, so we can draw a little arrow for that. Bingo, wants to go in. But what about the electrical force? 
of sodium. Which way is it going to want to move, in or out? Out. Oh. Well, the cell's negative on the inside, and sodium's positively charged. So is it going to want to go in, or is it going to want to go out? In. In. Absolutely. It is also going to want to go into the cell. Notice sodium really, 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 really wants to get into the cell. It really wants to get into the cell. And we can actually use that to our advantage. That's one of the main things we use to do work with the cell. We say, okay, sodium, you can come in, but you're going to do some work for us. Because sodium really, really, really wants to come in. Now notice this works the exact same for calcium as well. Notice for calcium as well, its chemical force is going to be into the cell. Its electrical force is going to be into the cell. So both of those are going to be a driving forces wanting to come in. But, and I think I've already said this once, but if not, I will say it again. Calcium makes cells do wonky things, right? If you are a muscle cell that wants to contract, if you're a neuron that wants to produce an action potential, if you want to release a secretion from a gland, calcium is what helps those cells to do that. So we don't normally want to let calcium in. Calcium really, really, really wants to get in, but we only let it in when the cell wants to do some special kind of work. But notice potassium and chloride are different. What is the chemical force for, what's the direction of the chemical force for potassium? Remember chemical Going out of the cell. Out. Side of the cell, absolutely. Our chemical force is gonna to be to want to move out because it's gonna to wanna to move from a high concentration to a low concentration. But what about the electrical force? Potassium is a positive ion. Does it want to be on the inside or does it want to be on the outside? Inside. Yeah, it's going to want to go into the cell. The cell, absolutely. So in this case, its electrical force is in, its chemical force is out. So does that mean if we open a potassium channel, potassium doesn't move? No, if we open a potassium channel, potassium moves and potassium moves in because as it turns out, the chemical force for potassium is bigger. So the two are not equal. This is the bigger force. And so when we open, when we open a potassium channel, potassium moves inside. Let's do the same thing for chloride. What is chloride's chemical force? In or out? Uh, in. in. Excellent. What is its uh, electrical force? Out. Excellent. Out of. And which of these two do you think is bigger? Do you think it's the electrical force coming out? Coming out. I would imagine it's electrical the electrical force. Potassium. Say again. I would imagine it would be the same as for potassium, the chemical force stronger. Exactly. The chemical force is stronger. And so when you open a chloride channel, chloride moves in. Exactly. So for both of them, it's the chemical force that is greater. And so when you open a potassium channel, potassium comes out. When you open a chloride channel, chloride goes in. And let's do this just to be, whoops, no, not that. Perfect. All right, excellent. Fair. Fair. All right, perfect. Excellent. So now that's worth saving. So I'll save that one. All right, excellent. So here I've done it with these amazing pretty pictures from uh, my drawing because I'm amazing that way. But let's take a look at some of the pretty pictures from your textbook as well. Oh. <laughs> I've done this on the page. Oh, how funny. All right, I thought that I did this on the whiteboard. Okay, hold on, let me save this again. There we go. Okay, excellent. So now I have to erase it all. So we can do this. So again, here we see the example of the 
Uh, I, I didn't give you the reason. Great question. I didn't give you the reason why the chemical force is stronger. I'm just telling you that for those two ions, it's stronger. When we actually get to the nervous system, we will actually learn why. So we will come back to these ideas of a chemical gradient and an electrical gradient or that membrane potential when we get back to the nervous system. So I'm introducing you to these ideas now, but I will actually explain it to you why when we get there. So we'll see why when we get there. So thank you for asking that question. So yes, I'm just, hey, I'm waving my hands right now and you're just gonna have to take it on faith for right now, but I promise you by the end of the class, we'll make some sense of it. Excellent. So. Things like potassium, there's more inside than outside. Things like sodium, more outside than inside. We have those chemical gradients. We have the electrical gradient where the inside of the cell is more negative, the outside of the cell is more positive. And so when you put those two forces together, because uh, again, anatomists love to name everything, both of them influence how something wants to move. So they call it the electrochemical gradient. All right. so. As you notice, most things move down their concentration gradient. The chemical gradient, the concentration gradient in general for all ions tends to be greater. Uh, so they tend to move down their concentration gradients. Uh, and so that's what we focus on. But when we get to the nervous system, we'll see that like everything, it's a little more complicated than that. All right, excellent. So where are we time-wise? We're doing awesome time-wise, but this is a good stopping point. I know this was a little convoluted at this point, but trust me, like I said, we'll make more sense of it as we move later on. We just need to understand that there are different driving forces on, that get our ions to move. All right, and again, because they're charged particles and they're gonna be affected by the electrical gradient as well as the chemical gradient. We still need to talk about the water movement of water. And remember, when we talk about the movement of water, we're still talking diffusion. So the other thing we need to do is, all right, if things can't just pass through the plasma membrane without any help, then how are we going to get them through? We need to talk about the passive and the uh, active membrane transports through proteins and the proteins involved in that. So we need to talk about that stuff as well. So we still have a fair amount to go, but this is a good place for our first break. Let's go ahead and take our first break. We'll take a 15 minute break, come back at 1.32 and at 1.32, we will pick up from there. All right. I will see you guys in 15 minutes. All righty, so let's go ahead and get started. Any questions before we get rolling? All right, perfect. We've been talking diffusion. And so that brings us to basically a very similar identical concept and that is osmosis. Osmosis really is just diff diffusion of water. And again, this time I'll make sure I'm on the uh, whiteboard so that we can do this. Clear this, draw my beaker again. So as we've already talked about, I have my beaker. I have my diaphragm that goes down the center and we'll pick different numbers this time. Let's say that on this side I have, we'll go back to Kool-Aid or glucose, something fun like that. Uh, let's say we have 80% uh, glucose on this side. And then we have 50% glucose on this side. Oops, that's why I spelled glucose, right? On this side. And again, I take my screwdriver and I poke my holes, which way is glucose going to move? Dimitro, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh I don't know if it's a dumb question or not, but... The only dumb question is the question not asked. What is the exact meaning of gradient? We've been using the word a lot. Maybe you already went over it, but chemical gradient, electrical... What does the word gradient itself mean? Gradient really just means a difference in angle. 
It, it refers to angles. So okay. if you think about like, for instance, it, when you go hiking, uh, there are gradients to the mountain that you're hiking. So it just really just, when you have two things that are unequal, the difference between them is the gradient. Okay. And obviously the bigger the difference, the steeper the gradient. Yeah. Right? And so that's really all that, that we're talking about here. And again, it, 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 it works for mountains, it works for rolling balls, it works for, for uh, solutions like this as well. All right, excellent. So using this gradient, 80% glucose on one side, 50% glucose on the other, which way would our glucose move? It's the right. Or the right. Yeah, it's gonna to move to the right, excellent. And we know it's gonna to continue to move to the right until what happens? Equilibrium. 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 What would equilibrium in this case be? 75. The... I know this involves math. I know that makes it a little bit trickier. <laughs> Is it 75? Um, 65. There you go. 65% on one side and 65% on the other. Excellent. Again, of course, at that point, we would reach equilibrium and there would be no net movement. All right, perfect. We're comfortable with that idea. We understand that idea, that's not, not new. However, if instead we had special proteins instead of holes, and these special proteins or our holes were so tiny that glucose couldn't pass through it, but water could, the glucose wants to move to the left, but if it's, the holes are too small, it can't. So it wants to do this, but it's not able to. However, if the holes are big enough, water can move. And in this case, which way does water move? the left. In this case, water would move to the left. Many of you who have taken some kind of biology class before, you've learned this rule that water follows salt or water follows stuff. All right. These are the rules that uh, you're learning in some basic biology class. And again, if you've learned that and you know that and you're comfortable with that, that's perfectly fine. Water is going to go to where there is more stuff. But I don't like new rules. I don't like special rules. As we've talked about, all osmosis is, osmosis is diffusion of water. So if we understand the rules of diffusion, we understand the rules of osmosis. So let's rewrite the question. Yes, this side is 80% glucose, but what the heck's the other 20%? Would it be water? Exactly. So this side is 20% water. And what is it on this side? 50%? 50? 50% 50 water. Water, just like solutes, likes to move down its concentration gradient. And it's gonna move down its concentration gradient, as we mentioned, by going to the left until it reaches equilibrium. And what would equilibrium for our water be at this point? 35 and 35. Yeah, 35% on this side and 35% on this side. So water would move from one side of the speaker to the other. Of course, when that happened, if we were to go back and draw our original water levels here, the left, excuse me the level of water would go down on this side and the level of water would go up on this side until it reached that equilibrium point. Of course, at this equilibrium point, again, there is still movement, just no net movement. Now, can you really get water to do this? Yeah, absolutely. Back in ancient times, when people talked about YouTube, this is what they meant, right? We have a uh, tube with a diaphragm in the middle 
that has very tiny holes in it, large enough that water can pass through it, but not large enough for glucose to pass through. So notice there's a lot more glucose on the left, very little glucose on the right. Glucose really wants to go to the left, but it can't. But that also means there's a lot more water on the left and less water on the right. So water wants to move down its concentration gradient. So again, you can think of it either way. It is going to where there's, wow, that's way too big. Water is going to where there is more stuff or water is going down its concentration gradient. Either way you wanna think of it, it works the same way. And it is going to do that until, notice not equal volumes, but equal concentrations. Right, equal concentrations on both sides, which is equilibrium. This, I believe, is the picture from your textbook. I do have another picture that shows the exact same thing. What I like about this one is it shows the water molecules as well to emphasize that there's more water molecules on the left, less on the right, and it continues to move to the right until not equal volumes, but equal concentrations. Now, once my YouTube does this, is there any way I can get that water to go back to the left? Hmm. Well, I'm asking the question, so what should the obvious answer be? There's also a big blank on the screen. So what should the obvious answer be? Yes. Yes, there must be some way, absolutely. So think about it. How could I force this water to go back to the other side? What kind of force could I put on it to get it to go back to the other side? Pressure. Pressure, absolutely. And not just any pressure, but a pressure on the water. And that pressure on the water, like for instance, if I applied a weight or a force to it, would be a hydrostatic pressure. So hydrostatic pressure is basically the opposite of osmotic pressure. If I were to put a force on it, I could force that water back to the other side. And that would be our hydrostatic pressure. Water pushes against its boundaries and water then those boundaries push back. Hydrostatic pressure. All right. Questions on that? Mm -hmm. All right, excellent. So from here. I have a question. Oh. So um, in reality, let's say we had like that square bin we started with, would the water actually visibly change or the pressure is enough to keep it at different, um, at different concentrations, even with um, the change? Great question. It would, it would, you are absolutely correct. It would totally depend on the size of the beaker and the strength, the integrity of the uh, membrane because you're absolutely right, it would start to go down, but as it started to go down, it would put a lot of pressure against that membrane, especially if it was a large thing and likely would break it because water, as, as we've seen, right, all over with, with you, know, the, you know, the tornadoes and hurricanes and all that stuff, we're seeing it with our flash flooding, is very powerful. That, that, that osmotic pressure can be very powerful. That, so that hydrostatic pressure can be very powerful. So yes, you would absolutely get it to do it. It's easier, notice the, thing, the nice thing about this YouTube is it is a small, narrow surface to it. And so with a smaller surface area, it's much easier to get something like that to move. So it's easier to do it in this, but you could actually do it in a beaker as well. If you had a strong enough membrane, you could do it in a beaker. All right, excellent. So obviously we don't have too many YouTubes in our bodies, but these concepts are definitely things that are important because like I said, in Sacramento, we know, don't we for the we, how important maintaining the consistency of water is, right? This effect of water on the cells is what we know as tonicity. And again, this is not a concept. This is again one of those concepts that I know you know, even though you don't know you know it. Because as you know, in Sacramento, I don't know it doesn't feel that way right now, but in about four or five months, it's gonna be a hundred degrees outside. And when it's a hundred degrees outside, is that a good time to get up on your roof and tar your roof? 
I'm like no. degrees outside. No, probably not. And if you do that, you're probably going to get dehydrated and they're going to rush you to the hospital. And as they're rushing you to the hospital, are they going to take a big, huge bottle of uh, Avion and inject that into your arm? No. Just straight no. deionized water right into your body to rehydrate you? No. 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 Why wouldn't they want to do that? Because you need like salts and stuff like that. Right, because of the tonicity, absolutely. What we want for ourselves is what we call an isotonic solution. With an isotonic solution, we want the cell to be surrounded with the exact same amount of things. Here, let me actually cheat and do this first before we look at the picture, All right? We have a beaker and we put one of our cells inside of it. And as we know, our cells is both water and stuff. So if like we talked about, we took that deionized water that is 100% water and no percent stuff and we put our cell around it, well, what would happen in that case? It would try to reach equilibrium. Yeah, and so which way would water move? Towards the cell. Yeah, it would go to where the stuff is. It would go down its concentration gradient. We don't know what this percentage is, but we know it's less than 100. So water would start moving into our cell. And as a result of that, that cell would swell up and that cell could actually burst as a result of that. So as you guys talked about, we want to use a lactated ringer. We want to use something with salt in it or something along those lines so that we have the same amount of stuff. In the surrounding environment than we do in the cell. So we want to use that lactated ringer. We want to use that sodium chloride uh, solution so that we have the same amount of water and stuff outside the cell is inside the cell. That doesn't mean that water won't move, that it just means that there will be an equal movement across the membrane and the cell will be happy. And that is what we call an isotonic solution. That isotonic solution is when the cell is happy. All right. Now, let's take one more example. You're dehydrated because you were um, tarring the roof and they had to give you the IV, but instead, because it's 100 degrees outside, you decide to take a boat out onto the ocean. And that boat out on the ocean capsizes, right? And you're stuck in the water for three days. As you're stuck in the water for three days, you're surrounded by the ocean so you don't have to worry about dehydration because you can just dip your head in and take a nice big swallow, right? Um, you don't want to? No. no. I, know, I know fish poop in it, but when you're stranded there soaking in the water, you, it's okay to drink a little bit of it, right? Uh, no. A little bit, I Why guess. Not? Oh. Why not? Why isn't it good to drink it? Too much salt. Oh. Yeah, there's too much stuff. There's too much stuff in the water. There is water, but our salt water of that ocean is too much stuff. And there you go, exactly. Now what's gonna happen is that it dehydrates the cells. It actually pulls water out of the cells because there's too much uh, stuff. And that, so if there's a down concentration gradient of our water, the water is going to where there's more stuff and our cells shrivel up. So exactly, again, when you get your boat capsized and you're stuck in the water for three days, yes, you have to worry about things like sharks, but most people end up dying more from dehydration because they are completely surrounded by uh, that solution, right? Well, and that, yeah, exactly. If you drink urine or if you drink the salt water, you're just dehydrating your body even more. It pulls more water out of your body, aside from making, you know, of like the intestinal discomfort that would go along with it. Um, and that fish poop, let's not talk about that. Uh, but um, yeah, absolutely. So we have these other imbalanced situations. If you're in that salt water where there's too much stuff, we call that a hypertonic solution. 
And as we talked about, that causes the cells to shrivel up. As you can see, we do this with red blood cells. When they do this with red blood cells, that shriveling up is a process we call crenation. Conversely, if we gave you that IV of um, deionized water, we call, would call that a hypotonic solution. And as we talked about, water would fill that cell and swell that cell. And just like a water balloon, if you put too much water in a water balloon, what happens to it? It pops. It pops. And that's the same thing that can happen here. Our cells can lice as a result of having too much water. And this is exactly what happened to that woman who, uh, for the video game, she drank too much water. Uh, her blood became hypotonic. As a result of that, her cells ended up swelling. She ended up having organ failure. And they did the same thing for a wee as well. Oh yeah, no, that's what it was. No wee for the wee, that's what it was, yeah. Um, yeah. Fraternity did it too, and the kid ended up dying. Who did it too? And one of the fraternities was years ago and they uh, were chugging water and one of the kids died. Yeah, if, from exactly this. You Wait, end up making your blood hypotonic and what happens is that water rushes into the cells, causes the cells to die, which leads to organ failure and can ultimately lead to death. Yeah, someone have a question? Yeah, so wait, our body wouldn't, is that like a disorder, the cell lies, or this can happen to anyone from drinking too much? Well, um, so it's not a disorder. It is an, an effect of osmosis, the power of water's movement. Again, they uh, drank massive amounts of water in a very short period of time. So we're talking about multiple gallons of water in a very short period of time that ended up upsetting the balance of their of the tonicity of their blood as a result of that. So again, you've got to work hard to do it, uh, but uh, but yeah, technically you can drink yourself to death just with water. I did not know that. That is so crazy. So don't drink too, don't drink more than a gallon of water at one sitting and you should be okay. Um, hold on, there's a couple, uh, the original Jello diet caused this as well. I didn't realize there was a Jello diet. That's interesting. Um, salty foods. So, uh, not so much with the salty foods. Obviously, when you have salty foods, that salt ends up in your body. And one of the things it does do is it causes you to retain more water as a result of that. So you can get see, you, uh, too much of a salty diet can cause higher blood pressure, uh, swelling and edema and things along those lines. But not the same way that drinking, uh, <laughs> it's, not, it's okay to drink water. Just don't drink massive amounts of it in one sitting. Uh, yes, Dimitri, you have a question? Uh, just a quick one. Um, so somebody claimed that they they haven't been drinking water for over two years. They drink juice. They drink like anything. They just don't like the taste of water. And I don't know if it's true or not. Like are they Portuguese? <laughs> no, no. Well, no. I I I asked. My mom is Portuguese. Uh, she was born in Portugal. She was born in a little island of Madeira, right off the coast. And she hates water. Her whole family grows grows up hating water. They all hate water. They live on an island but they hate water and don't drink water. So yeah, they drink other things that you can, and remember uh, many of the foods that you eat have moisture in it. So yes, you can get, you can get uh, moisture from other things other than water, yes. Personal experience, I didn't drink water one time for six months and like I just survived on tea. Yeah. Okay. I'm still here, so. Well, you know, tea's got water in it. So. <laughs> but no, I totally get it. Uh, you know, my- uh, uh, It's caffeine. My, yeah, exactly. My oldest daughter, Big, uh, when she uh, when she was younger, she didn't like. She really still doesn't. Uh, she like any kind of carbonated beverages or anything that was uh, had too much like like sweet stuff or, or juices or things along those lines. You know, when she was like one or stuff like that, she used to always say, "Oh, spicy, spicy." She didn't like that, and so she drinks almost exclusively water. She drinks water and milk. That's pretty much all she drinks. But so yeah, so it, it, everybody falls along the spectrum. But there's plenty of ways that you can get the moisture necessary to keep you alive. Uh, I have a question. Can you yes. uh, really quickly go back to the isotonic solution? I think yes. I, for some reason, I am thinking that it's the same thing as the hypertonic. No. Where it works. So, okay. You, I, I see where you're going to this. So base, so the key to this is with an isotonic solution, uh, the uh, water has the same amount of stuff as the cell. All right. In a hypertonic solution, uh, the water 
has more stuff in it than the cell. And in a hypotonic solution, the water has less stuff than the cell. And so because of that, water moves. When the water has the same amount, then there's no net movement, right? So for every water that goes in, there's water that comes out and that's not gonna show up. So we'll use white, comes in, comes out that way. When the water has more stuff, right? Remember then that means that water is gonna be drawn out of the cell. It's gonna go to where there's more stuff or it's moving down its concentration gradient. And if the water has less stuff, then water is going to move down its concentration gradient or water moves to where there's more stuff and water moves into the cell. And causing it to burst, which is with a hypertonic. Yeah, well, it, in an extreme case, it could just cause the cell to swell like this one here. But if it continues to swell, it, again, the greater the gradient, the more it's going to fill up. And like we said, like a, a water balloon, you can overfill it. And if you overfill it, it's going to pop. Well, I'm all for drinking meat and beer. All right, excellent. Not together, that's gross. All right, excellent. So that is our osmosis. And again, basically just simple diffusion of water. And again, this brings us back to that point of getting across that membrane, right? There are basically two main ways we get across a membrane, passively and actively, right? Passive transport methods involve simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion. And we'll define all these things as we work our way through it. Um, and we'll talk about the difference between channels and carriers. And then we have active transport as well. All right, so let's talk first about our passive transport. Let's actually do this on the whiteboard. I think this is gonna be the easiest way to do this. And then we'll go back and go through it all together. How are we on time? We're doing good on time, excellent. All right, so let's do this. I need to move this out of the way here for a second. That down there, this over here, this over here. And that gives me plenty of room to play, perfect. All right, so first thing we need is a plasma membrane. So this here is my plasma membrane. So the first big division we need to make, and so we'll use a nice big fuzzy line for this, uh, that, 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 and that. So let's do it right there, is going to be between uh, passive and active transport. Passive membrane transport, of course, as we mentioned, uh, does not require any uh, ATP. Now, because it doesn't require any ATP, it relies on primarily the concentration gradient of the substance. So going from a high to a low, like that ball rolling down the hill. All right. Now, there are different types of passive membrane transport. The simplest of these, as we know, is just simple diffusion. Of course, simple diffusion means that it just passes through. This is, I'm gonna need this to be smaller for it all fit in here. Passes through plasma membrane. without any help. And some remind me again, what are the characteristics that we need for something to be able to pass through simple diffusion? Um, small. Okay, small. Bit soluble. Bit soluble. And 
That was the other one. Non-polar. Non-polar. Non -polar. Non-polar, perfect. So for that simple diffusion, thing, things just pass right through the plasma membrane without any help at all. And of course, intimately related with simple diffusion is osmosis, which as we talked about is basically the simple diffusion of what again? Water. Water, excellent. Which again, even though we fully don't understand the mechanism by which it's able to do it, we know it is able to sneak through that plasma membrane all by its tricky self. All right. So that is our simple diffusion and osmosis, which are obviously related. That means the other type of passive membrane transport is what we call facilitated diffusion. What does facilitated mean? What does it mean to facilitate? Help of something. Yeah, exactly, with the help of something. Uh, great question, Amanda. I would say that um, I am OK if you want to consider it a part of simple diffusion or if you want to consider it a separate process. The movement of water across the plasma membrane is so important that we've called it osmosis. And we talk about osmosis as a separate thing and osmotic pressure and everything that goes around with that is absolutely 100% uh, important and a significant uh, concept. However, when it comes to the rules of play, it basically is just the simple diffusion of water. So I'm also okay with you just thinking of it as the simple diffusion of water. If I asked you to identify the types of uh, passive membrane transport, you would definitely need to mention osmosis. But if you want to lump it in with simple diffusion, I'm okay with that. If you want to lump it as in its own process, I'm okay with that as well. Okay, thank you. So just water specific then. Yeah, osmosis is specific to water. Yes. Thank you. All right, excellent. So as you guys mentioned, facilitated diffusion means that the diffusion needs some help. And that help comes in the form of proteins. These are more specifically transmembrane proteins that allow substances to pass through the plasma membrane. So they're going to allow movement of things that are not small, are not uh, nonpolar, are not lipid soluble. And there are basically two main types of facilitated diffusion proteins. The first are our channels. And remember, the channels are the door frame. The hole in the door frame is the pore. So you could think of them in terms of channels or pores. Either of them are fine that way. And again, the key with these are they're static. They don't change. So again, if we were to draw a simple illustration of what this might look like, We can have two big fancy looking proteins embedded within the plasma membrane that can allow substances to move into or out. Now, one of the important things to remember about channels is while they're passive, while they're static, they can still be selective and they can still be gated, right? Again, just like your house. On your house, hopefully, there is a front door, all right? And more importantly, a front door frame that holds the door in place. Now, that door when open allows you and your kids and your dog to get in and out. But how many people can get their car through their front door or their pet elephant through their front door? Anybody able to do that? No. No, exactly. So notice one way it can be selective is by its size. And it can be restrictive. 
when you leave, you lock the front door so that we well, may enjoy, well, again, in a non-COVID situation, you may enjoy the uh, company of your neighbors. Do you necessarily want your neighbors roaming around your house when you're not there? Not particularly. Not particularly. So that door can be locked. It can be gated so that it can be opened and closed. So we can have channels that are just for sodium or just for potassium or just for glucose or things along those lines. And they could be opened and they can be closed. But again, they're passive. Sodium is going to move through it based on its driving force. However, how many people, oh, a couple of people have raised your hands. Go ahead. Yes. I don't want to jump ahead, but gated, does that mean the cell decides not to allow a new substance in or what, what else does that mean? Great question. Gated literally means, like we said, that there's a, there are proteins that can block the door. So block the pore so that sometimes it'll be open and sometimes it won't. So there could be an extra protein here that blocks it. And then the question becomes, what moves that protein out of the way? Sometimes it can be a chemical. When a chemical binds to the protein, it moves away. Sometimes it can be a change in the membrane potential or a movement of the membrane that causes it. But basically what it means is sometimes there's a, going to be a door that's closed and sometimes that door is going to be open. That's okay, thank you. Indicated. Is yeah. this kind of similar to um, like when you, I'm trying to think of an example right now. So like meds, some meds you take and they dehydrate you and you have to drink like a lot of water with it. And then you, you pee it out basically. So is this similar to that? Um, I, I understand the analogy that you're trying to make, but remember at this point, we're talking about things on a cellular level. So right now we're talking about these channels, we're talking about these gates on a cell. So mm -hmm. these are channels that let things like sodium into the cell or potassium out of the cell or glucose into the cell or things along those lines. So it doesn't have anything to do with the... In the grand scheme, how much water you absorb can be related to things like this, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. So I think we wanna stick at a smaller scope right now. We're just talking about the movement of things into and out of uh, of your cells. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Now, this is one type, this gated uh, or, uh, or selective channel, but the other type of passive uh, membrane transport is what is called a carrier. Carriers uh, have to change shape, or if we want to be fancy, we can say undergo a conformational change. So if you want, you can call grandma up on the phone today, say, hey, grandma, guess what? Carriers undergo a conformational change. She'll be very impressed and she'll send you 20 bucks in the mail. But what does that mean to undergo a conformational change? What does that actually mean? That the protein changes Yeah. to let it, something pass? It changes shape, exactly. That's all it means. All it means is that the proteins change shape. Now, remember, this is still a passive process. So I know it gets a little confusing. Well, how can this change shape when it's a passive process? And my answer to you for that is how many people here have been to the Sacramento Zoo before? I have one person who raised their hand, second person who has submitted to it, a couple people nodding. Excellent. How do you get out of the zoo? Through the exit? Yeah, Remember but that what's one gate that what, rotates? Yeah, what? Someone describe to me the gate to get out of the Sacramento Zoo. Is it a turnstile? It is. It's a big, huge, massive metal turnstile. Now, is the zoo got a motor hooked up to that that's plugged into their electricity and they're paying the energy cost to spin that around so that you can get out? No. no. You I mean, want to get out of the zoo. What do you have to do? Push it and turn it yourself. Energy. Exactly. You have to push on that and you turn that around. And that is exactly what happens with a carrier. 
Again, I'm gonna draw really simple examples of these, but hopefully they will get the point. So again, what happens here is we have a protein, a carrier, and let's say for instance, it is pointed in this direction. So it's kind of angled through the plasma membrane like this, where it's only open on one side. What then happens is our friend, the glucose, comes in and when the glucose binds to it, the energy of the glucose binding to it causes the protein to change shape. And when the protein changes shape, what ends up happening is that it reverses so that it closes on the top and it is now open on the inside. Of course, once that happens, then our glucose lets go of our protein. And once the glucose lets go of the protein, guess what happens to the protein? Restores its original shape. Yeah, it goes back to its original shape. So basically what happens is that this protein, when the, when the glucose binds to it, it causes the protein to change shape allowing the glucose into the cell and it goes back to its original shape again. And so again, it is changing shape to bring the protein in like that revolving door. But like that revolving door, the molecules providing the energy, the cell isn't. So the cell still isn't using ATP to do this. So it is still a passive diffusion. I've kind of drawn some examples of these here, but let's look at the pretty pictures from your textbook. So again, channels, facilitated diffusion, it's passive, it's specific, and it can be gated. And here we see two great examples of these. Here we get a better sense of these circular proteins. Again, the proteins form the channel. The hole in that channel is the pore. Notice this one happens to be selective for potassium, allowing potassium to flow through it. But notice there are two additional proteins that we see here. These two additional proteins are a big globular protein and a long linear protein. They have a very technical term. They are referred to as the ball and chain. And as you can see, what happens is the ball of that ball and chain can wedge itself in the channel. And when it wedges itself in the channel, that channel is closed, it's now blocked, and the potassium cannot travel through it anymore. So again, they can be specific, just letting potassium through, just letting sodium through, just letting an amino acid through, but they also can be gated. They also can be opened and closed. Notice here, we see an example of a carrier facilitated diffusion. Again, here was our plasma membrane, here are our proteins. Notice they're open on one side and closed at the other. The advantage of this is it allows large molecules in, all right? If you were going to put a hole in your house big enough so that your pet elephant could get in, the problem with that is other things could get in as well, right? It's okay to put that doggy door on the back, but nobody has an elephant door on the back, right? Because just about anybody could get inside. So we need a trickier way of doing that. And that's what this is. So a larger molecule like glucose, when it comes in and binds to it, and there's that fancy term, the protein undergoes a conformational change. Again, it's very fun to say, makes you sound very, very impressive, but again, it's just a fancy way of saying that it changes its shape. When the glucose binds to it, it changes its shape, closing at the top, opening at the bottom, so the glucose can come in. And of course, as soon as the glucose lets go, what did we say it does? Back to the original shape. Back to the original shape. And a new glucose binds, changes shape, and it comes in. And again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And during none of this is the cell using any ATP. So this is still a passive transport. All right.
is facilitated diffusionally in one direction goes to one direction? So great question. Phyllis, with diffusion, remember it's going to be the ion that determines the direction. So notice if we cheat and go back to the care uh, to the channel, this channel happens to be a potassium channel and potassium goes out. If instead it was a sodium channel, which way would sodium move? Want to move in. Right. So exactly, oops, it would want to move in. So again, these things are going to move in the direction based on their concentration gradients. So their concentration gradients determine the direction they're gonna move. Technically, sodium could move out this channel, but that's not the way the cells work. If the cell, if you made a cell and put extra sodium inside of it, then yeah, the sodium would leave. But there's more sodium outside, uh, less inside, so sodium's gonna come in. Uh, yes, great question. So if you wanted to stop this coming in, you could inactivate these. Uh, you could also stop expressing them. You could pull it off of the plasma membrane so that less of them came in as well. So yes, you, we absolutely can control how much glucose we get into the cell, absolutely. All right, any other questions on our passive diffusion? All right, if we are comfortable with passive diffusion, let's spend some time now talking about active diffusion. Once again, we need to define, uh, no, sorry, not active diffusion, pardon me, uh, active transport. Diffusion is passive, so active transport, I'm sorry. Membrane. Transport, excellent. Again, we wanna first start with a definition and our definition of active membrane transport is that it either directly or indirectly uses ATP. Now, while passive membrane transport doesn't use ATP, here we're either gonna directly or indirectly use ATP. And while with passive, we go down the concentration gradient, typically we use this to move substances against their concentration gradient. All right. And I guess I am gonna have to make that smaller. There we go. So typically we use this to move this against it because sodium, like I said, really, really, really wants to come into the cell. So do we really need to use ATP to get sodium to go into the cell? No, it's gonna do it on its own. Now, notice there's two parts to our active membrane transport. It either directly or indirectly uses ATP. So not surprisingly, there are two types of active membrane transport. The first is what we call primary active transport. And the second is what we call secondary active transport. That's convenient. What do you think the difference between active, a uh, primary and secondary active transport is? The first. True, primary is first, secondary is second. Excellent. How else might they be distinguished? Like look back, each look back and think about our, de our definition of active membrane transport. Didn't one directly use ATP or we could indirectly use ATP? So what do you think the difference between primary and secondary active transport is? Primary is direct and secondary is indirect. The secondary go. is like your second option if primary fails. Okay. Or I, is unable to. It, I wouldn't use that analogy here, but you absolutely have the right idea. 
primary active transport directly uses ATP to move the molecules, to move the substances. Whereas our secondary active transport indirect does not directly use ATP, but needs it to continue to work. And we'll see how that functions in just a second. Now that's a good guess as well, but nope, nope. It's about how, whether it directly uses ATP or doesn't directly use ATP. Now, Primary active transporters are typically thought of as either transporters, or they can also be referred to as pumps, or they're sometimes referred to as ATP aces, because they break down ATP to get the energy to do work. And there are lots of examples of this. Uh, one very simple example, as we talked about, remember calcium makes cells do wonky things and cells don't necessarily want to do wonky things. So one of the things that we have is we have, oops, we have these calcium pumps. And what a calcium pump does is it directly uses the energy and will make my ATP yellow. So that's my ATP. It uses the energy of that ATP to move calcium. And which way do you think it uses this ATP to move calcium? Into the cell. Well, but remember, which way does calcium want to go? If we opened, if we poked a hole in a cell, which way would calcium want to go? Into the cell or out of the cell? Where is there more calcium? Yeah, yeah it would want to go in. There's more calcium outside the cell, so calcium would want to go in. So if we're using ATP to move calcium, guess which way we're moving it? Out of the cell. Out of the cell, out. absolutely. We are going to kick it out of the cell. We're going to use that energy from the ATP to kick calcium out of the cell. A very, very important uh, pump transporter. However, it's probably not the most important. The most ubiquitous, which is another big fancy word, but the most common transporter pump that we have on the cells, when a cell is at rest, about 25% of the ATP being used by your cell is being used to work. Sodium potassium. There you go. The sodium potassium pumps or what we call the sodium potassium ATPase. Again, a single ATP, the energy from a single ATP is used. So I'll draw my ATP on there. And guess what the sodium potassium ATPase moves? Sodium and potassium. Sodium, potassium. Which way do you think it moves sodium? Oh, from the cell. Out. Remember, sodium really wants to come in the cell, so we're going to have to move sodium out. Guess which way it moves potassium? Into the cell. In. Into the cell. And it doesn't just do it in a one-to-one -one ratio. Does anybody actually know how much sodium one ATP is used to pump out? I heard it say it again. So I think I heard someone say it. Three. Three, absolutely. It kicks three sodium out of the cell. And how many potassium does it bring inside? Two. Exactly, excellent. Two potassium that it brings in. Wait, does it do that all sim simultaneously? Did I miss something? Yep. Well, not entirely simultaneously. I'll show you the pretty picture of that, but yes. The short answer is it uses the energy from one ATP to move both three sodium out and bring two potassium in. So notice these pumps can move one or more substances. So 
that can be just a sodium pump or just a potassium pump or just a calcium pump, but we can also have pumps that move multiple things. All right. Notice here, we'll cheat and go back here. So active transport, again, it has to be mediated. It has to be facilitated because it always has to use a protein. Typically moves molecules against the concentration gradient. That sodium potassium ATPase is the most common of these. It can be primary or secondary. Oh, I got the secondary ones first. I lied. Okay, we'll show you the pictures later. We'll come back to that. All right, I promise we'll show them, but I don't want to jump ahead. All right. Whiteboard. So. Um, oops. All right, questions on that? So that is our primary active transport. I, I think I missed something or mislabeled something in my notes. So we talked about passive transport, but part of the passive transport was also facilitated transport. Is that so, correct? Remember, facilitated means that it needs proteins. So does water need a protein to get into the cell? No. No, right? Oxygen doesn't need a protein to get into the cell. So those are simple diffusion. However, if you're using a channel or a carrier, they're facilitated, meaning they're using a protein. And the same thing is true here. For active transport, all active transports are facilitated, meaning that they all require proteins. Okay, so there are some facilitated diffusion and facilitated active transport. All active transport is going to be facilitated because all active transports can require special proteins. Okay, thank you. All right. Yep. So, any questions on primary active transport? All right. Secondary active transporters, as we mentioned, do not directly use ATP. And secondary active transporters are what are also referred to as co transporters. They always move more than one substance. And in fact, they actually use the energy from one molecule to do their work. Again, this isn't a new concept because back in ancient times, if you wanted to have a um, a uh, lumber yard, or if you wanted to have a mill to grind flour, where did they put that mill? Where there's wind. True, one way they could do it was they could use wind. They'd use windmills to be able to do it. Or what would be the other thing they would use? Water. Water, they'd put it by a river and they'd put a big wheel in there. And as that wheel got spun by the water, they would use the energy of that water to do work. Right? I keep using the example of rolling a ball down the hill. If I'm at the top of the hill and you're at the bottom of the hill and I wanna give you your grade on the first exam, I could use my own energy to yell it down to you or to walk the test down to you, or I could tape it to the ball. And if I tape it to the ball and let the ball go, the ball's gonna do the work for me. And that is exactly what happens in a co-transporter. In this co-transporter, and let's talk about an example, we mentioned there is an ion that really, 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 really wants to get into the cell. What was that ion we said really, 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 really wants to get into the cell? Uh, calcium? Or True, calcium does too, but remember calcium makes cells do wonky things. So Fine. we don't wanna just Fine. let that one in any old time. What was the other one? Sodium. Sodium, which conveniently enough is the most common of all of our cations. 
So sodium really wants to come inside. So what we say is, all right, sodium, you can come inside, but when you come inside, I'm gonna use your energy to do some work. When you come inside, you need to bring an amino acid in with you. Or I'm gonna say, hey, sodium, when you come inside, I'll let you come in. You really, 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 really wanna come into the cell. I will let you into the cell. But when you come into the cell, would you mind kicking this hydrogen ion out when you come inside? So you can come inside, but you gotta kick out this hydrogen ion on your way in or bring a glucose in or kick out a calcium, right? Something along those lines. Notice I have two types of co-transporters, one where they both move in the same direction. We call this a symporter and one where they move in the opposite direction and we call this an antiporter. So the same way we can use that water to spin our wheel, to run our lumber yard or to run our water mill or the windmill to run our, uh, although I, apparently I'm told windmills kill birds or something like that, cause cancer. Windmills are apparently are horrible things, right? At least that's what our ex-president used to say. So, um, but we light the sodium in and the sodium does work for us. Now, does this make sense? Hopefully this part makes sense. What doesn't make sense to me is how this is active membrane transport. Active membrane transport requires the use of ATP. And I didn't draw little yellow ATPs anywhere on these two molecules. So how is it that this possibly uses ATP? Can anyone figure that one out for me? Is it because there's an exchange like the, it can only come in if something comes out. Well, but with the SIM porter, nothing is going out. All right, I love using fake numbers. So let's use fake numbers. Let's say we know there's more sodium outside of the cell. So let's say there's 10 sodium outside the cell. And let's say that there are six sodium inside the cell. Right? We know there's more sodium outside than there is inside. So great, sodium wants to come inside. So I let one sodium come inside and bring in an amino acid. How many sodiums do I have outside now? Nine. How many do I have inside now? Seven. And now I let a sodium come in so it can kick out a hydrogen ion. How many sodiums do I have outside now? Eight. How many sodiums do I have inside now? Eight. 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 Does sodium want to come in anymore? No. If I've got eight sodium on the outside and eight sodium on the inside, sodium's not going to want to come in anymore. And if sodium doesn't want to come in anymore, I can't get sodium to do work for me. So as soon as that sodium comes in, what do I need to do? Use the sodium potassium pump? Either the sodium potassium pump or any type of pump, but you've absolutely got their idea. As soon as it comes in, I need to kick it back out again. Yes, I could use the sodium potassium ATPase to kick it out, but we also just have some sodium pumps. Of course, a sodium pump would use ATP to kick that sodium out of the cell. So notice in this case, these co-transporters do not directly use ATP, right? They do not directly use ATP. However, if we don't use ATP, if we don't use ATP to kick those sodiums out, they won't keep doing work. So that's why they're secondary. They don't use ATP, but without ATP to kick out that sodium, they can't continue to do their work. The reason we let it in is because it does work for us. 
we're able to use it to bring in that amino acid. We're able to use it to kick out the hydrogen ions. It really, really, really wants to come inside. So that's a strong force. So we can use that force to bring it in and then we just kick it back out again. Would it ever happen or would, mm, how am I trying? Would it happen like if say it did balance or if no one, no more wanted to come in, what would happen then if we didn't kick it out? So if you had an ion imbalance where suddenly you, you know, you're on such an extreme low sodium diet that suddenly you start losing the sodium in your blood and in your plasma, then that sodium imbalance would cause cells to start to malfunction. Okay. Yeah, so absolutely. No, and because again, six and, 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 and 10, and those are just artificial numbers. I'm just using those for simple examples, right? The only numbers I would say that are here that you need to know, and again, we're going to use it plenty, so you're absolutely going to know it, is this one right here. That a sodium potassium ATPase, one ATP kicks out three sodiums and brings two potassiums in. Obviously, these numbers over here are just ones that I made up. Uh, to, to illustrate my point in a simple fashion. Well, so as we talked about, if you're ingesting a large amount of salts, then typically that means your body is going to end up retaining more water to, to dilute that to the healthy level so that we can maintain that isotonic contraction, I mean, that isotonic relationship. And so that means you're going to have a larger blood volume, which means you're typically going to have a higher blood pressure. And are there complications that come from having a higher blood pressure? Absolutely, right? One of the first things people do when they have high blood pressure is they put them on a low sodium diet and they give them diuretics, right? Get rid of that excess water, get rid of that excess salt to help bring the blood volume and the blood pressure down. And once they go on one of those diets or once they have to do that, isn't it like long-term? Um, again, everybody's... It, Everybody's health and everything else is, is variable. If, if, if you eat and adjust and maintain your balance and, and, and your weight and things along those lines, increase your activity level, are there ways to be able to bring sodium back into your, um, into your system? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are genetic predispositions to a high blood pressure. So yes, absolutely. That is something that can be a factor as well. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I, again, I think it's all about maintaining homeostatic balance. So it's a constant process. So it's not one way or another. It's not like once you start doing something, you're necessarily gonna have to do it forever. It really depends on all the other factors and influences that are going on. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. So they're gonna do things like that. Now, uh, I breezed over it quickly on the previous slide when we talked about this. So I do wanna come back and make sure that we talk about it here. And that is, remember, there is a third type of membrane transport. Uh, anybody catch on the slide where we talked about a third type of membrane transport? Was it yesterday? Uh, no, actually, Tuesday? there was a slide earlier, but I rushed through it. The only thing I can think of is uh, transportation via vesicles and exactly. microtubules. No. You are absolutely correct. That is it. This vesicles. How about microtubules? Is that considered a um, memory transport? Well, well, let's think about it. If I used a vesicle, if I made a vesicle that contained a substance and I brought it to the plasma membrane, and when I brought it to the plasma membrane, it attached to the plasma membrane and released its contents, what would we call that process? Exocytosis. Exocytosis. Absolutely. Are we getting things across the membrane in that fashion? Yeah, right. Yeah. By the same token, if there is some substance, a virus, some other molecules or something like that, that attach to the plasma membrane, and what ends up happening is the plasma membrane folds around it and brings it in and forms a vesicle around it containing that substance on the inside. 
what would we call that process? Endocytosis. Endocytosis. Now, are these ways that we typically get things like sodium or potassium or glucose into or out of the cell? No, these are typically for large things, for very large molecules. But it is a way that we get substances into and out of the cell. So this is still considered a type of membrane transport. So we have passive membrane transport, active membrane transport, and vesicular transport. These are the three ways we get things into and out of the cell. Now, as I've said before, I've done a truly amazing job of drawing this right here. But um, let's take a look at the pretty pictures from your textbook. So again, uh, with active transport, we always use proteins, always uses ATP. Most common is sodium potassium ATPase, can be primary or secondary. Here we have our secondary tra transport first, and I'm not sure why this is. I'm gonna go and switch that as soon as we're done with this lecture. Uh, secondary active transport requires our co-transporters, requires ATP to use indirectly, and it comes in two flavors. Symporters, where both molecules move in the same direction. And then antiporters, where they move in opposite directions. And so here are the pretty pictures that go along with this. Someone was asking about the sodium potassium if it is at the same time. As you can see here from the illustration, and again, this is still a symbolic illustration, but it is a good representation. Notice the molecule, the channel, the pump, I should say more specifically, has a specific shape where it's open at the bottom and our three sodium are able to bind to it. Then our ATP is split releasing the energy with that phosphate. And when that phosphate splits off and uses that energy to change its shape, that allows the sodium to be expelled and allows to potassium to come in and attach. That phosphate, once the energy is done, goes away and it goes back to its original shape and the two potassium come in. So notice the energy of a single ATP kicks out three sodium and brings two potassium in. Here we see our illustrations of our secondary active transporters. Again, we emphasize that sodium really, 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 really wants to come into a cell. So we let that sodium come in, but it's got to kick out a calcium. We let that sodium come in, it's got to kick out a hydrogen, right? These are our antiporters. Or we let the sodium come in and it brings in a glucose. We let sodium comes in and it brings in an amino acid. In this case, both things are moving in the same direction. These are our symporters. All right. Questions on that? Is, oh, go ahead. Um, how about microtubules? So microtubules are important for the movement of substances within the cell. But remember right now we're talking about transport across the membrane into or out of the cell. So those microtubules allow those movements inside the cell so we can move things from one side of the cell to the other. But in this case, we're talking about passing the plasma membrane, getting into or out of the cell, not what's going oh, on inside. But aren't you allowed, allowed to move stuff uh, to other cells with microtubules? Typically not, no. Okay, never mind. All right, great question though, any others? All right, so here's the game plan. Let's do this first. I want to go back here. All right, now I'm in the right place. So here is what's gonna happen. Uh, we are going to do a combo thing here where we're gonna take our next break 
but you are also going to have the opportunity to take your uh, practice lab exam. So let's see how we are time-wise. Time-wise right now, it is uh, 2.45. You've got 25 minutes to take the test and we will do, we'll do this. 25 minutes to take the test, but we'll also take a 20 minute break. So what that means is the test is going to be due at 3.30. That'll give us an hour to talk about it afterwards. So let me make it due and only available until 3.30. And the test is timed, is that correct, for 20 minutes? Yeah, so 25. So you'll have 25, it's 20 questions. You will have 25 minutes to take them. But again, it has to be taken during this time. If you start at 3.25, you're only gonna have five minutes to complete it. Okay. Do we have to go through proctorio is or is it going to be like one of the quizzes that we take that we took like the attendance quiz? Well, see, I, I wasn't going to use proctorio, but I had a couple of people who said they wanted proctorio. I'm inclined to um, I'm inclined to uh, not use proctorio because that's not the point of this. Uh, but so I'm not going to use proctorio. I know some people said they wanted to, but I guess if you really, really are struggling or concerned about it, I can open up that Proctorio quiz for you again, just so you can use that experience to be able to familiarize yourself with that. But between the chemistry quiz and the Proctorio quiz, you should hopefully have a hand on Proctorio. So I'm not gonna make you use the Proctorio stuff for that. Uh, I, I, uh, I won't make you use the video, let me rephrase that. Let's do that. What's it under? Hold on, hold on, I haven't, I haven't released it yet. Um, there we go. Let's see how, what that looks like. Oops, no. All right, so I'm not recording you, but I am going to lock down the screens and the tabs and the printing and the clipboard and the cache and all of that. All right, I'm not going to require any kind of verification. I'll leave your whiteboard, so I'll do all of that. So again, we'll use the lockdown procedures for it but we won't, uh, we won't require the video. So let's do that. That's the easiest way to do it. So I thought you wanted us to ask questions during it, like on the Zoom call. No, I'm not, no, the, you can, you're not gonna be able to flip over to the Zoom call. You need to be full screen and do all the other lockdown stuff. So here's what we're gonna do. We're going to meet back here at 3.30. You can take this right away if you would like or if you want to take and then take your break after, or you can take your break first and then take the practice lab exam. I have now published it, so it is available. You will use Proctorio, but you will not use the video uh, for that. Uh, and we will meet back here at 3.30. At 3.30, we will go over the practice exam together. Is All right. it in the quizzes or is it in modules? It's in the quizzes. All of the, all the exams will be in the quizzes. So can, before someone pops over and starts it, can someone check to make sure it's there? I don't see it yet. It's there. I see it, it's there. Okay. It's there now, excellent. All right, so use your Proctorio, take that. Again, it won't require, not graded. I'm not even gonna look at it. This is an opportunity for you to learn and for you to gauge yourself, and then we're gonna go through it together. All right, so take this, uh, meet back here at 3.30, and at 3.30, we will go over the exam together. Uh, to make sure that you guys understand uh, what is going to be expected of you, why I picked those questions and everything else. All right. <laughs> so see you guys back here in uh, 45 minutes. So take your quiz, take your break, and I will meet you right back here. Again, no points, nothing else. This is truly just for uh, you. And it's going to be due back at 3.30. So it closes at 3.30. So make sure you do that now. All We're right. We're to see all our answers at the end, right? So we can ask you questions about it. No, but we'll go over it together. Oh, we'll okay. Go over it together. Okay. So we will go over it together. All right. So you should be all set up. That should be correct. Yep. So yeah. So you guys shouldn't have any problems with that. Go ahead and take a look at that. And then we will see you um, at 3.30. All right. I'm going to stop recording now.